everyone. My name is Evie Lupine. Welcome back to my channel. And today I have another video for you all. Today we are going to be talking about my first power exchange relationship. A couple of weeks ago, I did a video talking about my first experiences in BDSM in general and going to my first dungeon event, but I kind of got into everything all at once and I thought it would be very worth it to do a separate video just talking about my introduction to power exchange because I think I did some things pretty right, especially for being completely brand new and I did a lot of things wrong <laughs> that I hope you all can learn from as well. So just to pick up where our previous chapter of this story left off, I originally got into BDSM not being in a relationship. I wasn't bringing in a vanilla partner to BDSM with me. And initially on my journey, I discovered two people that I ended up playing with at the same time who knew about each other. Looking back on it now, we could maybe call this a version of polyamory because they both knew about each other, but I didn't think of it that way at the time because I didn't hear the word polyamory literally anywhere in any context until I'd already been doing kink for a couple of years. So I did not know what poly was, but I did have two people that I was seeing and playing with. And one individual I talked about last time who was my trainer, they were someone I did not see really as a romantic partner. We would dance together. We would do things like that, but it was more of like a social thing. And then I would go over and see them. And then they would tell me we were about to do something that day. Like, oh, today we're going to try rough body play. Today we're going to try hoods. Today we're going to try gags, whatever. Like that was more the relationship. And then the other person who ended up being my dom, we initially had a much more loose play-based relationship that very quickly got into power exchange. He was not my trainer. He was not meant to be someone who was taking on this role of like, oh, I'm not really your dom. I'm just there to train you. So we pretty quickly knew that what I wanted with that later individual was a power exchange relationship. And I thought, my ignorance, of course, that I would somehow be able to continue both of these relationships. But eventually, both of them came to me around the same time and were like, uh, so you know how you're seeing that other person? I don't want you to see anyone else anymore. I want us to be exclusive and like take our relationship to the next level. And I really thought about this for a long time, but it was very agonizing because I didn't want to pick. I liked both of them. And if I had only known about polyamory, maybe we could have negotiated something and would have been able to make that work. But alas, that was not in anyone's vocabulary around me at the time. So I had to pick someone and ended up dropping the person who was my trainer and ended up moving into a DS relationship with my first dominant partner. And I had experimented with sort of ds -y things at this point. I did not have a DS relationship, but there had been flavors of it with wearing collars. We talked about that last time. You know, I had done stuff sort of by accident. And then even getting into my young adulthood years, I had had people that I'd met through FetLife or people that I'd met at parties that I did something with that looking back on it now was very DS flavored. But to me, I didn't really understand the difference is quite yet of like where was the line between masochism, bottoming, and then actually being a submissive. To me, they all kind of blurred together and were more or less part of the same package. So I didn't really quite get that you could be one totally without the other because I just hadn't seen that yet. But in any case, I decided to go into this DS relationship with this person that I had been seeing. And we basically immediately created a contract. I have no idea where I got that idea from. I don't think I invented it like out of thin air, but we actually, I went over to their house and I sat with them and we actually wrote out a list of rules. And I want to say we started out, I wish I had a copy stuff, but we started out pretty ambitious in terms of rules. I think we maybe had like 10 or 15 for our first sort of contract. And a lot of them were pretty simple. You know, it was like, oh, you know, you're going to refer to me as sir, right? That was one of them. But then other ones were much more grandiose and 
probably not doable in reality, especially because we hadn't really been together that long yet. And we didn't know like how our schedules would work because I was still in university and they were working. So we, how we were going to mesh our schedules and also not living together while doing DS, we had not figured that out yet. But that was not going to stop us from making a contract. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> that was not going to slow anything down. And I will say initially, because at this point in time, I wasn't publicly identifying as being asexual and I didn't like explicitly talk about that with these partners. Initially, there were a lot of rules that were quite sexual that I would absolutely not do now. But because it was important for especially that dominant partner, like I was willing to acquiesce to that because again, everything was really blurry for me. I didn't realize quite yet that you could separate between masochism, bottoming, submission in a romantic way versus a sexual way. I just sort of assumed, well, like, of course, you know, even if I'm not really that into it, any dominant's going to want something sexual, even though it's not really like my thing. So I was happy to attempt to go along with that. It did not end up working out. So that would be a really key piece of advice that I have for people who are new to DS is, this is something I say all the time now, is do not be overly ambitious with your first contract or even a set of rules. I really think, and this is something I learned in that relationship, is if you start out having like 10, 20 plus rules all at once, it's going to be really hard for both the dom and the sub to adjust to that and not feel like they're dropping the ball because it's hard to work in, you know, good morning messages and a good morning ritual and, you know, an evening devotional set of position training sequences or whatever. Like, it's hard to mesh all that in, even if it sounds really amazing on paper. Your real life should hopefully take priority, especially initially where you have school, you have work, you have family, you have other stuff going on. Okay, so you're not really going to have time necessarily to fit all that in, especially all at once, just jamming it all in there. So I recommend going one thing at a time, building literally off of one rule that feels really solid to start with, and then next week, add another one, then evaluate it on the second week, then add another one. Just go very sequentially, build it up over time, and then check in as you go along and figure out, hey, does this work for us? You know, do we want to change this? Do we want to make this less of a priority? How do we feel about this? Does it actually do what we want it to do in the relationship? Because the way that I had initially had things set up essentially for me, because this wasn't really something that we talked about, it was sort of all or nothing in a way, like one failure of one rule destabilized all the rest of the rules and it made it feel like the DS wasn't as important because, well, well, we couldn't do this and this and this this week because of, you know, work scheduling issues or a car broke down or whatever. So it made the rest of the relationship feel less DS-y, basically. So that's why I really recommend building things up because when you're new and you're first starting out, even just a little bit of instability and having to troubleshoot can make a really big impact on the relationship and seem like a bigger deal than it really is. And I think, especially online at that time, there was not a lot of information about what practical, everyday dom-sub relationships looked like. And so I just thought everyone waltzed in and had a whole contract and just went with it from the jump. And it was totally fine, no issues. Everyone else could work through it. And that was something wrong with me and our relationship that we couldn't make those things work. Come to find out through future discussion groups and actually having more personal conversations with people in the community, I, I found out that actually, yeah, most people have trouble managing that level of DS right off the jump, and especially because I had not known this person for very long. We didn't even really know what our DS style would look like yet. And of course, I was also, and this is also another thing too, being accurate about your level of experience as a dom is really important. Now, they had had what they would call other DS relationships, but that looking back on it now with almost a decade of experience, it's DS, sort of. Like, it wasn't a formalized contract thing. They didn't have any, at least from what I remember now, they didn't have any previous experience with, like, collaring anybody or having anything really long-term. It was more of an ad hoc sexual bedroom thing and not a continual relationship built off of DS. And though that felt very good for us initially, just... A wish and a dream does not make a sustainably DS relationship. And I'm talking about it now, and it makes it seem like it's very doom and gloom, and it was, like, super rocky right from the get-go. But it really wasn't. We had a very connected, 
good relationship for at least a year and it worked really well. But looking back at it now, I can see so many things that would have been better had they been done differently and had room to grow been part of the priorities that we set for ourselves. So we had this relationship, we had this DS thing and you know, they would give me orders and we had rules and it all flowed more or less pretty well. We also had punishments and we had rewards. And this was a big thing on Pet Play Instagram at the time. That was like, whoo, hot, hot topic. And so it was taken as a given on Pet Play Instagram and elsewhere that if you had a DS relationship, of course you were going to do rewards and punishments. That's part of how you make a DS relationship work, right? And so, of course, we were going to include that in our relationship as well, especially because my partner was much more of a sadist. And so they wanted to have essentially excuses to do more sadomasochistic type activities. And I actually can't believe that I've kept this because I've moved a bajillion times, but I guess it is sentimental in a way because it is from my first DS relationship. And I'm kind of happy that I kept it because now I can show it on camera. And it's a very like interesting snapshot of that point in my kink journey. But the way that we did punishments and rewards is this is a very popular thing to do on social media is we put together a set of jars where one was like, the reward jar, and one was the punishment jar. And the way that we had it set up is I wrote out the rewards I wanted for myself on slips of paper and then put them in the jar. And then if I followed the rules, if they felt like I was doing a good job, they would pick out a reward for me. And then they wrote out all the punishments. I don't think I saw them at the time until they would actually happen, but they picked a lot of punishments and then they put those in the punishment jar. And I guess that felt like a fair way of doing it. I would not do it that way now. I feel like especially, again, new relationship, new to BDSM, punishments can include so many different things and can step on so many landmines without meaning to. It's really important to talk about everything first and be like, hey, is this okay? Because even though punishments are meant to be punishing and they're meant to deter unwanted behavior, that's the whole reason for a punishment, it should still be something that you consent to. And I find a lot of people didn't think enough about that part of it, like the consent part of it, which is really important. So I didn't have any issues with that part in particular with that relationship, but certainly in other DS relationships and in general, I saw with people that that was a problem. So this is, this is the jar that I made and I got stickers from, I think it was Joanne and I got glitter letters and I painted it. And I even still have, oh my gosh, do you want to see? This is like opening up a time capsule. Do you want to see what one of the rewards I put in here are? I've not looked at this in like almost 10 years. I'm like nervous about, what does my handwriting even look like at that point in time? Oh, this one's cute. I'm not going to show up. I'll just read it. It says movie of choice with sir. That's cute, actually. That's not a bad reward. Uh, so I just get I get to pick a movie because, yeah, we they would definitely pick movies for us, mostly when we watch stuff together. So that was like a way for me to be able to have like a little bit of a reward getting to sit with my my sir and actually pick the movie. So that's fun. OK, so that's like one of the rewards. It was not very like high level stuff. A lot of it was like you know, get like go to PetSmart and pick out a new pet toy. Like that was the flavor of stuff I remembered being in there. So it wasn't anything extravagant. I think I kept it pretty grounded as far as rewards go. But the punishments could get a little, <laughs> could be a little much sometimes, but they were mostly okay. It wasn't anything that was like, I'm going to shave your head. But you know, for somebody who was not comfortable with masochism yet, especially, you know, I wouldn't be comfortable with masochism for like five plus years after this relationship was over, it took a while to get there. And that was not helpful for that part of the journey. So that's how we set up the relationship. And we would go to parties together at one of the local dungeons. And we would do a lot of pet play stuff together. And they would throw toys for me. And we would play in a group with other people. And we also started to experiment with bondage together. And that's actually how we met. I don't know if I included that in the previous story. I think I did, but we actually met because I was RSVP to a rope class on FetLife and I didn't have anyone I was going with. And they messaged me and were like, hey, are you going alone? Because I'm also going by myself and like we could meet up. And that's how we ended up hanging out. And then we did rope together. And, you know, we didn't really do any super high level rope stuff, but I initially, like when I first get into BDSM, I 
uh, like rope bondage was not in my mind as like an activity to do. I very quickly got interested in it, but it wasn't something that I was drawn to. I was drawn to pet play and DS and that side of things. But bondage was sort of an unexpected discovery. And in that relationship, we certainly learned a lot. And so we go to these parties and we do like light bondage and pet play. But again, my dominant at that time was very interested in masochism and sadomasochism. So we did quite a bit of pain play. And this is Honestly, this is, even to this day, it's a little uncomfortable to talk about, but it's something that I think is really important, again, for newer people to learn, which is why I'm sharing it. But, you know, we were also really young. You know, we were in our very early 20s at this point. He was only like a year older than me. So, you know, it wasn't like we were, you know, I didn't have an age gap with this person. So we were pretty close in age and also therefore close in terms of experience level. And this is something I would hope with time would be ironed out, but at the time it wasn't yet. So we would go to events and we would want to engage in, you know, maybe some impact play. And, you know, we had some basic toys. You know, we probably had like a paddle. We did spanking. I don't even think we owned a flogger yet. That was too expensive for us is, you know, me being a university student and then them working a part-time job for not very much money. The the hundred plus dollars for one toy was simply not going to be done. So we had quite a bit of DIY stuff. And then we also had some like cheaper equipment that we had gotten from elsewhere and then also I'd gotten some pieces of equipment donated to me by like some older members of the local community which is very nice and so we had like a couple of toys to play with and there were a few spots in the dungeon there was a spanking horse there was a bondage wall to do different types of impact play and pain play with and I have a memory and also had actually this is not something I've seen in dungeons since then and let me know if you're somebody who goes to a local dungeon does your dungeon have toys that people there can just pick up and borrow because this dungeon the first one i went to they had like a whole wall of toys they had floggers they had foam bats they had crops they had canes they had all different stuff both diy and more upscale purpose-made equipment and i have not been to a dungeon since then that has either any toys at all or just like that system and I really miss that because as a newer person, that really made a difference because we could not have afforded to buy a set of dragon canes or even get something like a really nice hardwood, you know, paddle to play with. You know, we had very cheap stuff. And so that really opened up what we could experiment with. But that's not really the point of the story I'm trying to tell right now. But as a side note, I wish that was more commonly a thing because I think it's really helpful for people that don't have the income to be able to buy their own toys but who want to experience a range of different sensations. So that's just a random note for dungeons. But the thing I was trying to get into saying that's a little bit embarrassing for me even now is we were doing an impact play scene and I, I think I was on a spanking horse and I don't remember what toy we were using. It might have been a dragon tail. It might have just been spanking. But there was a sensation I just didn't like. It was a sensation I didn't really enjoy. And I was like trying to like scoot around to get comfortable. I was probably giving them feedback like, you know, that's a little too hard. Or maybe I was, I think I was even just like reacting in a way that like obviously they could tell non-verbally meant I didn't enjoy the sensation. I was trying to get away from it. I was maybe like growling a little bit because that's something I do. And they just were like not getting the feedback they wanted as a dom or as a sadist. And like I was trying. I didn't have a lot of tools in my toolkit at that time. I did not know about a lot of the fancier pain processing techniques that are out there but I was I was trying I wanted to be a good sub and I wanted to enjoy this thing because it seemed really important and I had already overheard stories from other people in the dungeon of like oh well like my partner they can do this and this and they have bruises everywhere like I was already being fed that messaging of to be a good submissive also means being a really heavy masochist and I was really struggling with that I was trying trying my darndest and I just couldn't I couldn't get there with that sensation and Instead of working with me on that and hearing that I was trying my best and that I was, you know, I just didn't know how to do what I do now with pain processing or communication. And instead of being willing to work with me through those things and and maybe like ramp things up from like a one to a 10 or just do something else that made me more able to process what was going on, they would get, to my mind now, they would feel rejected and they would be kind of snippy and they would essentially say well you don't like that so we're never doing that again and that felt really terrible to me and I think you know obviously from a consent perspective like if your partner doesn't like something do you want to keep pushing them to do it anyways like no but also especially when you're playing with DS and you're trying to explore masochism I think there are 
ways to work within that. Well, okay, like we're not going to go that far, but maybe we'll stick here. We'll try to blend in some other more pleasurable things or we'll try on a different part of the body or maybe we need to check in with like a warm up or something else to make it work better. And so that made me actually feel like I couldn't really share how I was feeling about a toy because I was scared of especially when this happened more than once of like, oh my gosh, like, we're not going to do this, and we're not going to do this, and, like, if something else gets taken away, then we're not going to have, like, anything to be able to play with anymore, so I need to make sure that I'm, like, locking it in, and I'm not showing how I really feel, and I'm just enduring it because I'm so afraid of, like, our relationship being reduced in scope so much, and that just was not the way to handle it on either side. I think for me, obviously, I needed to be more willing to speak up and say when I didn't like something and let the consequences be what they were because forcing yourself to endure pain when you don't like it creates a bad relationship with pain mentally that can go on to affect all other different types of pain and that takes quite a bit of effort to undo and to create a more positive relationship afterwards. And then on the other side, obviously, like, I think just sort of doing the Dom equivalent of like taking your ball and going home and being like, well, fine, you're not having the reaction I expect. We're going to do this again ever. Like, I think that's also like pretty immature. Hopefully they have learned better since then. But unfortunately, it seems like many Doms go in that direction because like there's a lot of, and I don't think I processed this originally, but I realize now that there is so much vulnerability in being a dominant partner of, especially with being a sadist and coming to terms with that. If you have a partner that's reacting poorly to it, it's obviously going to feel like a rejection. And it's also going to make you nervous about, like, do they really like me? Do they really want to be my submissive? So it's easier just to cut and run and be like, fine, we're never doing this again and just, like, slamming the door there. Because you might be afraid if you dwell there that that could damage the relationship. But the reaction itself also damaged the relationship. So that was unfortunate. But so anyways, that was sort of one of the big lessons was how we handled pseudomasochism. And we essentially had a relationship right all the way through me graduating university. And then when I graduated, I moved away because I had a vanilla job that I was moving to go do and they couldn't come with me because they didn't have the money and they were dealing with their own school issues. They were trying to get back to going to school eventually, but they had money issues and they had had a car accident and there was a bunch of stuff going on. And so we had this sort of a long distance relationship for a while, but that was not sustainable because like they didn't have a car and I would drive up to see them and then like they wouldn't have time for me. And I was like, well, am I still your sub? Because like I'm like trying to make time to see you, but then like you're hanging out with like your roommate's family and like that's not <laughs> like, like I'm, I'm driving like hours to go see you. That doesn't really feel like an equivocal relationship to me. And that was just disappointing. And so I actually ended up having to break up with them and end our DS relationship over the phone, which felt really bad, but I think was ultimately for the best because even though, like, we were somewhat trying to make things work, like, at some point they, like, rode their bike all the way down to see me one time and, like, they didn't do it again and, like, they basically did, like, a bike marathon to come and see me, which was nice, but it, it wasn't enough. And so I ended, the re I ended the relationship over the phone, which is really heartbreaking. And, you know, I had I was never collared at any point in this relationship. Like, I wore a collar during stuff sometimes, but I was not, like, officially collared. Oh, wait. Actually, <laughs> that's not entirely true. Because when I'm... I forgot about this. When I moved away and I was starting my vanilla job for, like, a month or two, I had a day collar that I wore that I actually picked out to to wear myself because I wanted some kind of symbol of our relationship to remind me of them when we were long distance that was like subtle it looked very much like regular jewelry and like it was something that I I just wanted and they basically were like hey if you want to do that that's fine so they were not really that involved in the like collaring process as a dom but it was more a collar that I wore not because I was collared to them but because I wanted a symbol I could wear that reminded me of our relationship while we were long distance and uh, very good intentions, but that did not save the relationships. Actually, I was kind of collared, but I self-collared myself sort of kind of in a DS relationship that was long distance. So in any case, we broke up and then I ended up meeting another partner after that that ended up becoming my actual like actual like first like real real ds relationship where it ended up being collared and it was definitely a learning experience i will say that i 
do I regret having my first DS relationship? No, it definitely taught me a lot about myself and what I want from DS. It taught me a lot about my own relationship to like sexuality and submission and how for me that was like not something I really wanted to include going forward, especially not nearly as much as I felt like I had to in that relationship. And also, it set me back in terms of my relationship with masochism, but I would eventually, years later, find stuff that worked for me. It just took a little bit of a longer time to get there. And I think it did give me a more solid grasp of the fact that, like, yes, I, I was now quite sure that what motivated me was DS, was submission, was pet play. And I wanted to keep pursuing that in relationships going forward, even if this one didn't work out perfectly. And, like, first DS relationships are hard. They're very much like having a first romantic relationship. And, you know, this was not my first dating relationship relationship and we were also romantic partners this was not my my first heartbreak or anything like that I really think that was good actually because if it was like my first DS breakup and my first heartbreak ooh, that would have that would have been really painful so I'm glad that it wasn't everything all at once but it it was it was tough it was tough to go through but I I honestly kind of quickly got over it once I had other people and other relationships that I was pursuing that immediately felt way more stable and I think that's maybe too near to the current day to get into that at this present moment but that is essentially my first DS relationship there was a lot of uh, honestly it was mostly a romantic relationship first and foremost and the DS was an accent to it in a lot of ways because of the nature of like how our lives were at that point but you know we def we kept up you know using titles we kept up forms of address and speech over text message we had rituals that we did you know I I would text them and tell them good morning and tell them good night like we had things that we did keep up with but uh, we had way too many rules initially at first, so definitely learned a lesson on that one. But I've been chatting about this one for almost half an hour once again, so I think that's a good place to wrap things up for now. If people want to hear more about my first experiences in polyamory, I feel like that is the next logical step because, oh boy, that's a whole other... That's a whole other can of worms. And it's very intermingled with my BDSM. Because again, my experiences with asexuality, BDSM, polyamory, all of that goes together. And it's hard to untangle completely from one from the other. So in any case, thank you all so much for watching. I would love to hear your thoughts about this one in a comment down below. If you have any embarrassing but educational first DS relationship stories that you want to share, I'd love to hear them in a comment down below. If you are still in that first DS relationship, I would love to know if this advice in this video helped you, or maybe you've been in your first DS relationship for like 10 plus years and it's still going strong. How have you made that work? I would love to know in a comment down below. If you did enjoy this and are ready, please do subscribe because I make videos twice a week about all different kink and BDSM related topics. And finally, if you want to support what I do, the best you can do that is with Patreon. Link to that will be down below. Thank you all so, so much for supporting me over there. It means the absolute world to me. And until I see you all next time, I hope you have a great rest of your day and a great rest of your week. Bye-bye.